opportunity to sing. I love to sing. I uh, don't do it very well, but I do the best I can. God didn't give me a whole lot of voice, but I caterwauled the best I can. If anyone ever asks, I do. But uh, And then at the house, I don't ask. I just do. Praise the Lord for that. But uh, this morning, I want to be a blessing to you. I'm going to have you turn to Psalm chapter 15, if you would. And uh, while you're turning there, I'm going to explain the birthing, if you will, of this uh, sermon. Uh, it, uh, it's kind of an interesting place it began. Actually, uh, I've got to give you some background to my life. Uh, when I was uh, 21, uh, I, uh, I married the one, woman of my dreams. Uh, now, just for the record, she was the woman of my dreams, but had she not been the one, woman of my dreams, when I said I do, she became the woman of my dreams either way. So, thought I'd throw that out there. But she is the woman of my dreams, praise the Lord for that. And uh, I am so thankful that uh, we tried our best to do it God's way. Perfectly, no, but we tried our best. And uh, kids, let me tell you, if you build a relationship on God's word, God's way, I promise you, it will last. I promise you, you uh, you will we, you will appreciate that. But uh, that's beside the point. But anyway, I married her. Well, when you get married, you learn some things really quick. Some of the things you learn is uh, your life is no longer your own, and uh, <coughs> you were bought with a price. Oh, uh, but your life is not your own, and uh, she was bought with a price. We're still paying for, right, man? But. Uh, <laughs> Your wife's gone, right? Yes, sir. That's right. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> see, he won't get in trouble. I already am. But uh, <laughs> the truth is that things change just a bit. I uh, tend to get up early in the morning, and I go hard all day until 9 o'clock p.m. 9 o'clock p.m., my eyes fall to about half the staff. That means they're checking out. They're wanting to be closed. They're desiring to be in the bed and uh, get some rest. Uh, but when you get married, you find out that things aren't the same. My wife, on the other hand, she turns her eyeballs all the way wide open about 8.30 in the evening. And so at 8.30 in the evening, she's ready to go. Let's take on the world. I'm at 9 o'clock ready to go to the bed. Let's shut the world off for a while. And so she invariably would, would like to get, and, and women do this, uh, uh, I've heard through the grapevine that women do this a lot. I know uh, from personal experience that mine does. She will ask me some of life's deepest questions at that moment of time. <laughs> We will get in the bed and my head's already shut down. My eyes are half staff and I'm trying to get out of here. Check out to La La Land. And uh, my wife will, uh, will start asking me questions. And of course, at that moment in time, I don't care. And so that's what I say. I don't care. Whatever. Yes, ma'am. But you got to do it in such a fashion so they don't think you're brushing them off. Right, guys? And uh, so you, you act interested. And, act, and, and such was the night when this sermon began. We got into the, the bed, and it was, it, I think by then it was 10, 10, 30, because it never is at 9 when I want to, but about 10, 10, 30, 11, whenever we finally got to the bed. I got in my side, and I had everything turned down. I was ready to go. We were checking out. I was heading to La La Land shortly. And uh, as I was fixing to check out, my wife did what she does best. She yeah. said, hey, let me ask you a question. I said, okay, baby, what is it? She said, what's your favorite Bible verse? In the whole world, what's your favorite Bible verse? And I had to wipe the sleep out of my eyes and get my eyes at about three-quarter staff, and I got to, to think. And I said, baby, I don't know. I said, I'm not like, I know some preachers have, and, and a lot of people have a verse that they, this is this one, this one, this. I said, baby, there's a gob of good ones in there. And I have a hard time if I sign Bibles. I don't sign just one regular verse. I sign a whole bunch of different verses because they're all good to me. So I'm laying there thinking, and now she has done the unpardonable sin. She has gotten my brain engaged, which caused my eyes to go full staff. And now I'm thinking. And now I'm thinking, well, baby, I like, uh, I, I like Proverbs 18.24. That's a good one. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend of six. I love that verse. But I, I also like uh, Philippians 4.13. I can do all things. I love that verse. And Philippians 4.4 4 is a good one. And I just started rattling verses off that I knew. And I started quoting them. And, and, man, I was there for a long time. 
But what happens in relationships, it's a give and take world. What happened at that moment in time as I started rambling off all these Bible verses, I noticed my wife got mysteriously quiet. You see, she had done the unpardonable sin. She got my brain working and she shut hers off. And so she started going to the zone and I'm in, I'm on a roll now. I'm saying verses and this verse is good and this. And I told her Romans, you know, and this is true. I, I, I love Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be love that verse. Love uh, verse 9 up there that thou shalt confess with. I love that verse. And, and then I said, but you know, as I've gotten older and just, I guess the thought of Romans 5, uh, 5, 8 means a lot. But God commendeth his love toward us. I like that part. That's a good part. But I love this part that while we were yet sinners, I love that part. Jesus died for me while I was yet sinners. And if you just left that, that while we're yet sinners, that just eat on your brain for a while. You get excited. Well, she had done the unpardonable. I'm wide awake now. I am preaching. I said, now we could even go to passages. There's passages of scripture that I love. I love John chapter 1. Boy, the first 14 verses, you can't beat them. I love John chapter 1. Then John chapter 3, where Jesus reaches out to, uh, to Nicodemus. And whoa, what a concept. He's going. The rich man shows up. Jesus is, is debating a, 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 a wealthy man, a knowledgeable man. But then I love John chapter 4. What's he do? He goes to Samaria, talks to a, a woman of Samaria that didn't know much just and, and didn't live right. Right? And, and Jesus reached out. What a concept. And then I, I can get started and we'll never stop. Love John chapter 17. Oh, John chapter 17. The real Lord's Prayer. Oh, that will. If you just read who he's praying for there, if that don't break your heart, you ain't got one. And uh, I love John chapter uh, 14. And so I was going through chapters and then I got decided, but maybe we could go in Psalms by now. She's snoring. But I'm on a roll, and I'm not going to stop because I'm on a roll. I said, hey, baby, we could go in Psalms. And she woke up like that. And I said, Psalm, I love Psalm chapter 1 and Psalm chapter 8. What great Psalm, Psalm 23. And, of course, Psalm 22 before it is great. Psalm 19 is wonderful. And I'm just going all these Psalms. And, and I said, and even Psalm chapter 15. That's a good one. And I went through all these Psalms, and by now she is ready to go. She says, baby, can we go to sleep now? Yeah, I guess so. So I reached over and shut my light off, and she went to sleep. I did not. For almost all night, I thought and thought and thought. And this verse, Psalm chapter 15, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh brightly and worketh righteousness speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor... Nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is condemned. But he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh up a reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. Wow, what a chapter. As a kid, I remember I had to learn that for a class. I can't even remember what class it was for, but they told me, memorize this chapter. We memorized it. We had to quote it in front of the whole student body, I remember. And so I had to learn it to where I could say it, and it's stuck in my head, and it's lodged somewhere in there. And uh, I, I, I remembered it, and I, I was thinking all that. I could not get verse 1 out of my head. I could not. I prayed and get it out of my head. At least put it back in a filing cabinet so I can get a little bit of a nap. I didn't sleep. All night I didn't sleep. And I was wondering and thinking on that. The next day I get up and what am I thinking? Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? And by halfway through the day I'm thinking the same thing. Lord, who shall abide in? I never opened my Bible. I never looked at it. I was just stuck in my head and I couldn't get rid of it. By now I'm having bitter feelings against my wife. Because not only has she taken a whole night of sleep from me, but now she has taken the whole half of the day. And then it was like God reached down and he whacked me on the back of the head. And he said, hey, lame brain, I'm telling you something. And I got to thinking, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? In the month of April, we made a decision. I made a decision. We, uh, we have a little committee that kind of helps organize what we do at the church. It's me, my wife, and one other lady. And uh, uh, we get together. We kind of hash out some programs and stuff. And we decided in the month of April that we were going to make the month of April. Uh, we we're just going to dedicate it to the tabernacle. 
The, uh, the Old Testament tabernacle, I'll tell you how crazy I am. A few years back, about four years ago, maybe five, we did the tabernacle in vacation Bible school. Now, those of you that know anything about the tabernacle and those of you uh, uh, elder statesmen here, uh, you know what I'm talking about. This tabernacle, if you say the word tabernacle, kids usually go, oh. And then if you're going to teach any principles on the tabernacle, everyone goes to sleep. So people are like, whoa, what is the tabernacle? So we did it for vacation Bible school. That tells you how stupid I am. Not only that. Here we decided amongst in our little meeting, we decided we're going to do the month of April. Every Sunday morning, I'm going to do a message on the tabernacle. And then I got to thinking, how am I going to keep anybody awake? How am I going to keep anybody awake? And so I started studying the tabernacle. And lo and behold, about halfway through my study on the tabernacle, I was wide awake. I was ready. I was excited. You know, we didn't have any problem keeping the people awake during the t teaching on the tabernacle. The tabernacle's a wonderful thing. Some of you kids are thinking, the tabernacle, that's this place right here, isn't it? No, this place is, is taken the name, and I'll explain later on why it's taken on the name, and it's fitting, so very fitting. But the truth is, was uh, in the nation of Israel, God designed and, and, and set up a place of worship, a place of meeting, a place really of sacrifice where the nation of Israel was to come and, and, and to, to worship God the way that he said. What's interesting is we just had four, five weeks to work on it, so I didn't have time to really set everything up like it should have been. But the tabernacle is an amazing, amazing piece of, uh, of equipment. It was portable. It's amazing what it was made of. But what's amazing about it is God was very picky about it. And just for the record, and this is just off the, the beaten path here, so you can disregard it if you want. But it's amazing that God does concern himself with detail. That's why this philosophy that God doesn't care what you wear, what you act like, what you behave like. As long as you love, it's okay. <laughs> That's not the God that set up the tabernacle. That's not the God that, that laid out the sacrifices. That's not the God that put together the furnishings of that tabernacle. That's not the God that I know in the Bible. For sure it's not. God does care and God is concerned about that. But we must move on. Let me explain to you because I took five weeks and explained the furnishings of the tabernacle. And so if you'll bear with me just a little bit. Say, yeah, kids, yeah, yeah, I know you've done it already. Oh, I don't know. I've worked with teenagers since I was a teenager, actually probably before I was a teenager, I worked with teenagers. And I know what teenagers, it's real scary when you hear a voice coming out here and you're putting it out here. That's intimidating. But I know, <coughs> like you're sitting on your shoulder. I have trouble enough sitting in a chair, let alone up there. But I know how teenagers do, and teenagers do that look, the zone I like to call it. Teenagers go to the zone. Brother George, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You ready? We're going to go to the zone. Y'all ready? This is the zone. <laughs> and some of you have perfected it so good that you can sit for two hours in the zone. What wonderful children you are. It's amazing to me. So some of you, I said the word tabernacle and it began. The look is like, oh my soul, he's going to get all deep and technical. So yes, I'm going to get deep and technical. But in the process of getting deep and technical, please pay attention. I hope that you'll listen because there is a message somewhere in here. I love, <laughs> I love the way, Brother Morrison, I love the way that you had your message with about two minutes yesterday. I mean, it was about... 45 minutes to an hour working up to the two minutes, but you did great. I love that because that's what I'm going to try to do here this morning. So you got to listen. This is all introduction and, and illustration long before we get to the message. We'll get the message at the end. Just hang on. The tabernacle is a wonderful place. It was designed by God. And I've only got time to explain the furnishings. I'm going to only take time to explain the furnishings. But real quick, there's a courtyard around the tabernacle. The tabernacle is kind of a tent thing. And it sat in the middle of this courtyard. And the courtyard, if I remember correctly, was 75 feet wide and 150 feet long. And it was kind of linen that used as a gate, if you will. And it was tied around. And there were these different poles all around. She had pillars all around in circles. And do not let me turn around again like that. Y'all are laughing. Don't let me do that. I'll go down. 
And what's amazing is there was only one opening to this tabernacle. Now, before I get too far into this tabernacle, let me just let you in on a hint. Every aspect of the tabernacle is to picture Jesus, Amen. just for the record. Amen. Every aspect Amen. of the tabernacle, every yes. aspect. Yes. Oh, and if I had time. And <clears throat> I wish I had time because you all would learn some things because some of you don't know anything about the tabernacle. If you learned something about the tabernacle, you wouldn't sit there oh, when somebody says a word. You'd say, really? Tell me some more. Yes. But tabernacle is an amazing thing. But what's amazing <laughs> to start off with, the courtyard. That's outside the tabernacle. Has this fence around it. And there's only one door to the fence. That's right. Really? Yeah. Only one door. I am the door. Hmm. Wonder who that pictures. Hmm. I don't know. That's not even in the tabernacle yet. And it's already picturing Jesus. Amen. How the Jewish community doesn't get it, I'll never figure out. They have chosen to put... This is a sidebar here. They have chosen to put the things and the traditions ahead of the, what the traditions are picturing. And some of you kids and some of us older people are guilty of the very same thing. Because I'll cut my hair short. I'll wear clothes that everyone expects me to wear. Never realizing the heart that should be behind me changing my outward appearance. Sorry, I wasn't meaning to go there. Tabernacle. One door. Courtyard. We're not to the tabernacle yet. If you think that's good, wait till we get to the tabernacle. We're at the courtyard and we're excited. I'm excited. Y'all could just sit there like deadbeats. I don't care. I'm going to get excited about something that pictures Jesus. That's all. That's what's going to happen. Now, <coughs> you're going to have to bear with me. You're going to have to bear with me. I'm coming to the tabernacle. I'm coming in. Can y'all hear me? It's kind of weird to talk here and hear it up there. Coming to the tabernacle. I'm going to go in the door. I'm a Jewish man. I have my lamb that I'm going to give as sacrifice. A lamb without blemish. Oh, oh, oh. That's got to be another picture somewhere, doesn't it? And I've got to take this lamb without blemish. And I'm going to take it inside the courtyard. Well, as I go inside the courtyard, I come to a piece of furniture. I come to a, the very first piece of furniture. Oh, my friends, if you're not excited yet, don't worry because I'm excited enough for all of us. You just sit there in your zone. I'm having fun. Walk right up. The, <laughs> this gets good. Walk right up. And you come right up. <laughs> the first. If you don't get excited about this. I'm going to have to throw something. The first piece of furniture you come to. Glory to God. It's the brazen altar. Let me just tell you some things about the brazen altar. Oh, I wish I could tell you why the brazen part. Because that's cool. But I don't have time. What I'm going to tell you. Is the brazen altar picture something amazing? Let me just tell you what the brazen altar pictures. The brazen altar. <laughs> Woo the brazen altar is a piece of furniture. <laughs> it's the highest piece of furniture in the whole tabernacle. It's elevated above the rest. Ooh, 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 if this doesn't get excited. I don't know who we're picturing here. It's elevated above the rest. And he brought that lamb. That lamb's throat was slit and its blood collected. And that lamb was put upon this altar of incense. Just for the record, that picture is Jesus Amen. on Golgotha's hill. That's right. Being sacrificed for all sins of all men for all time. Can I just make a statement here? If you go to hell, it's because you like to pay for things twice. Yeah. Yeah. Because the Bible teaches... Jesus paid for all sins. Everyone's sins. If Jesus paid for all sins, why would you pay it again? The only reason someone goes to hell is to pay for their own sin. Boy, it, gets, it, it makes me crazy to think that somebody would say, I'm going to go to hell. Let me go to hell. I want to go to hell. I like to pay th for things twice. You're looking at a guy that when he swipes that card in there and it says, is this the price you want to pay? I mash no. <laughs> no. And when it comes up and says, would you like cash back? Yes. <laughs> and the person back there says, no, you're punching it wrong. And I say, said you're giving me money back. Give it back. I don't want to pay things twice. Jesus paid for it all. If you're here today and you haven't accepted Christ as Savior, shame on you. You cannot be that dumb. 
You say, Brother Dusty, you shouldn't be that direct. You'll hurt. Listen, I'm just a little whiffet of a guy. And these fellers have been up hollering and screaming at you. I figure if they can do it, I can do it. And if y'all get mad at me, I'm hiding behind them. <laughs> that altar of sacrifice, that brazen altar. Oh, the picture that it is. Oh, and there's more about the brazen altar. We'll get back to that later. There's some stuff in here. I wish y'all had time. I wish you did and had a brain because most of you just don't. You have the altar of incense. Right after the altar of incense and the, the, the lamb was sacrificed, the blood was collected in a basin that was carried over to this other piece of furniture. The other piece of furniture was the brazen labor. I'm not in the tabernacle yet. We're in the courtyard of the tabernacle. We haven't made it to the tabernacle. Time out real quick. Just for the record, the priest couldn't go past that brazen altar or past that brazen labor and just go in to the, into the tabernacle because he'd get killed. He had to do it the way God said do it or he couldn't get in there. He couldn't get into that tabernacle. He comes, he gives the sacrifice, he collects the blood, he carries it over here to this brazen labor. Inside of the brazen laver is water. He takes that water and he washes his hands. This is exciting stuff because right here we pictured salvation and Jesus dying on the cross, did we not? Oh, what are we picturing over here? Cleaning up my life. Taking that will that I want, what I want to do, putting it here. Because just for the record, you can't get in that tabernacle until you do these things. Oh, there's a whole lot and I just don't have time. The priest cleans himself at the brazen laver and he walks into the holy place, if you will. Into the tabernacle, which was a room. Inside of this room were three other pieces of furniture. And boy, if you're not excited yet, just don't worry because I'm real excited right now. Because once you get inside of that tabernacle, once you get inside of the holy place, you look around and you see some articles of furniture over here. <laughs> It's the table of showbread. Oh, I wish I could explain all this. But the table of showbread, I believe, pictures Jesus. Oh, the bread of life, does it not? But then it also predict, per, pictures that Bible you carry in your lap that you throw around and don't read, don't pay attention to. And just for the record, that Bible is Jesus himself. In the beginning was the Word. And just for the record, my Jesus is pure, stainless, not tainted by anybody. Not NIV, not the RSV, or whoever initials are next. Jesus is pure. And his words are pure. And if I did not have a pure gospel, I would quit what I'm doing. I'd go home and become an honest man and get an honest job. The truth of the matter is, Jesus is pure. Therefore, the Bible is pure. And if any of you young people would realize what you hold in your hands, you wouldn't throw it around like you do. You wouldn't use it as a step stool. You'd realize the magnitude and the power inside of those words is the very same power Jesus himself had. Oh, you got me off boy base. Good night. Table of showbread. You get to see that. Oh, I like this one over here. This one here is a candlestick. Boy, if you, if you don't get excited about the candlestick, I learned some things about the candlestick. You know, all the other articles of, pro, of, uh, of, of, of the, uh, uh, the tabernacle were put together. All the furnitures were put together. But not the candlestick. If you read your Bible, you'll find that the candlestick was beaten out of one piece of gold. One piece of gold. Oh boy, that could preach. The truth is that they would take and they had to work and work and work to get it perfect. And the candlelight... <laughs> well... Jesus is the light of the world, the Bible says. Jesus is the light of the tabernacle, the Bible says. And just for the record, when we go to heaven, we have no need of the sun because Jesus, the light, is up there. Amen. Glory to God. Wow, what a picture we have here of Jesus. And then we could even go into the oil they used to keep the thing burning. And then you can use the concept of wicks. What are the wicks? Why couldn't we be wicks? With a little evidence of the Holy Spirit That's to go right, from brother. person to person to person. Right. Tell them about Jesus. Amen. Wow. We are the light of the world. Only if we dip in into the oil. Woo -hoo. 
candlestick. Then, behind there, right here in the center, is the altar of incense. I like the altar of incense. The Bible teaches that the incense pictures the prayers of the saints. Ooh, that's good stuff too. That's the altar of incense. The prayers of the saints has a sweet smelling flavor, a savor to our Savior. Wow, that's good. And it's positioned right in front of the Ark of the Covenant. Right there, just before the veil is, is this. And then what gets real good. Oh, I shouldn't do this now because I'm kind of jumping out of sequence. But I can't help it. Do you know who lit or what lit the altar of incense to get the incense burning? Do you know that they had to, <laughs> they had to get a little shovel and they had to come out here and they had to come to the brazen altar and get down at the bottom and get some of the coals from the brazen altar, the picture of Jesus himself, and carry it up there into the tabernacle. And right there at the, <laughs> at the altar of incense, they used the same fire that burned the sacrifice, tying that to the prayers of the same glory to God. Amen. Think about that. Amen. Wow, what a great God we have. Then, there's more. Because <laughs> then you get an opportunity to go in what is called the Shekinah glory. Where God lives. <laughs> I wished I had time. But <laughs> some of you were struggling with the word propitiation yeah. earlier. Pro How do you say that, Brother Dusty? I said, say the P word. That'll work. So some of them would say the verse and they'd say P word. And go on. I was okay with that. But let me explain to you what propitiation is. You see, this Ark of the Covenant was a box covered in gold. Inside of it was the law, was Aaron's rod that had sprouted, and was the Ten Commandments. That was what's inside of the box. It was sitting up there. Oh, manna. It's in there too. I like that too. And it pictures the law. It pictures the law. And the Bible teaches that because of the law, you and I are, de are doomed to hell. You and I are doomed to pay for our sins because without the law, Paul explains, without the law, we don't know we're sinners. Without the Bible, you don't know you're sinners. Why do you think that your teachers and your preachers and your youth workers, Brother George and Br Brother Morrison, stand up over and over, read your Bible, read your Bible, get in your Bible. Why? Because they want you to realize <laughs> you're sinners and need Jesus. It don't matter how good you think you are. <laughs> I heard this before. That the closer you get to Jesus, the more ugly you see yourself to be. That's the bottom of the box. The law. <laughs> Propitiation. We'll get back to that term. Is what the mercy seat does to the law. Ooh, if that don't get you excited, nothing will. What that means is that mercy seat covers up the law. Right. It covers it. Amen. God Amen. doesn't see our sins anymore because Jesus is covering them. Amen. The Bible says it up in heaven and I, I have a very picturesque brain so it has to picture this. I don't know if this is how it is so maybe it, I, just bear with me. I believe up in heaven when Dusty Ray got saved as an eight year old little boy. When Dusty Ray got saved and just for the record if you think his sin account was small then Mm. Just let me tell you, I was sneaky, sneaky little boy. And I had a sin account. And my sin account was hanging here. And there's Dusty Ray and a clipboard with four sheets of paper on it. Four sheets. But this is back in the day, the dot matrix day. You all know what I'm talking about, you older ones. Back in the day where four sheets could hang from here to here, but they all connected. And they connected the whole stack a whole stack of things. That's what I had done when I was eight. Just for the record, that's gotten bigger. Mm. When I got saved and asked Jesus in my heart, I believe an angel walked over to Dusty Ray's account and he said, this Dusty Ray's account. Hey, Gabriel, hand with this one. Whew. They picked it up. The Bible says that they walk over to another place. They take my sin. And they look up and there's Jesus. And the Bible says that they take Jesus' name down, put it here in this barrel. Dusty sins go here. They take Jesus' clipboard, which has nothing on it. <laughs> they put it with Dusty. Amen. You know, 
sir. Not only are my sins forgiven, but God looks to me like I'm Jesus. And I know I'm not, but he does. What a wonderful God we serve. That's what the propitiation did. Jesus covered me up. But again, that's not the message. That's just a little hint inside. A little peek inside of this place called the tabernacle. Do me a favor. I'm going to do unpardonable sin to teenagers. When you're speaking to te teenagers, you never ever make them go anywhere they didn't want to go. You want passage? Read four or five verses, and that's it, because they've hit the zone. So I know you're in the zone. So I'm going to cause some of you to wake up. Those of you sitting by someone in the zone, please elbow them. And tell them to do me a favor and turn to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. <coughs> All right, I know. Stretch. Yawn real good. <sighs> Stand, but y'all pull a muscle. Because this gets a lot better. We just getting started. Joshua chapter 1, the first six verses, the Bible says, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass. The Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do uh, give to them, even to the children of Israel, every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon. That have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses, from the wilderness that is in Lebanon, even to the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and under the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. There shall not be any man to uh, be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so will I be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee be strong and of good courage for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear to their fathers to give them who shall abide in my tabernacle who shall I came up with one instance of one person that I can say is an example of one that abode in the tabernacle take your Bibles if you would, a third place. Y'all are going to hate me, I'm sure. Turn to Exodus chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33. And let me explain. As you're turning there, I'm going to explain a little bit about this man, Joshua. Joshua, the son of Nun, is one of the New Testament pictures of Jesus himself. In fact, Jesus' name in the Greek language is Jesus in the Hebrew language was Joshua. Joshua and Jesus shared names. But that's not where the similarities end. There's similarity after similarity that Jesus and Joshua correlate with. And God used this man uh, to, uh, to, to, uh, to see Joshua brought the children of Israel into the promised land for a possession as Jesus brings his people uh, into uh, heaven and a heavenly life. If you're a Christian, that was extra. But just for the record, just, you know, I got started. Y'all shouldn't have done that. Did you know Christian means something? A lot of us are saved, but we ain't Christians. Christian means Christ-like or like Christ. If you're living and you're saved and you're living for the world, Christian. I'm not saying you're doomed to hell because you're going to heaven. You're just not behaving as a Christian. Christians are Christ-like. I'm sorry, that was extra. It wasn't part of the program. Exodus chapter 33, verse number 1. I think most of you are there. I understand, teenagers. I'm reading way too much scripture for you. We have overloaded your brain. We have been out of school for two months. But just for the record, you're fixing to go back. So I'm just freshening things up. You'll be fine. Exodus chapter 33, verse number 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, Depart and go hence, thou unto the, and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, unto the land which I swear to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, unto thy seed will I give it. And I will send an angel before thee, and will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, the Jebusite, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in the midst of thee. For thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. And when the people heard these evil tidings, they mourned, and man uh, did put upon his orna uh, upon him his ornaments for the Lord had sent unto Moses saying to the children of Israel ye are stiff necked people and I will come up into the midst of thee in a moment and consume thee therefore put off thy ornaments from thee that I may know what that uh, what to do unto thee and the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by the Mount Horeb time out let me explain what's happened here 
Moses went up to Mount Sinai, was up on Mount Sinai having a face-to-face -face conversation with God. Wow. And he was up there on Mount Sinai. And him and Joshua were there. We find out later that Joshua was there. Because God said, hey Moses, get down there. Those people are sinning. Because the people have erected a, a calf that just accidentally showed up. If you read what Aaron said, kapoof, there he was. I just put all the gold in a pot and kapooey, there it was. And then if you'll see a verse, few verses later, Aaron makes the people naked. That's what the Bible said. Aaron did it. And then <laughs> Aaron's put on the spot. Well, I didn't do nothing. I didn't do nothing. That's extra. Jumping ahead. Moses is coming down from the mountain. Joshua is there with him. And Joshua says, Moses, I hear the sound of war. I got to get down there. Joshua was the commander of the fleet. He had to get down there and do the work. <laughs> Moses said, now, that's the sound of sin. Can I just give you a little extra here? The reason moms and dads are Christian and love the Lord, the reason they fuss about your music is not, not because they don't want you to be hip. It's not because they want to torture you with all your life. It's that they know that's the sound of sin. And just for the record, unfortunately in our Christian circles, we've decided that that's acceptable for us. And I get a letter. I live right south of Nashville, Music City, USA. I get things all the time. I go looking up these groups of these things that come in. We're having a teen rally come in here. I cannot tell those people are Christian by their look. I know, I know I'm not supposed to judge them. I understand that. And yes, they probably have a good heart. But when a girl is showing off everything she's got on a picture that goes out to everyone under the sun. And she performs on stage exposing herself. I don't care if she's talking about Jesus. I don't want my son seeing that. Better yet, I don't want me seeing that. Amen. Let me carry it a step further. These guys are all fluff up there. And I know some of you say, well, your son fluffs up his hair. Look at Sam. He fluffs up his hair. Give him a break, y'all. Do you see how tall he is? He gains almost an inch and a half with the hair fluff. Let him be tall. Good heavens. The truth is, when it sounds and looks like the world, I don't care if they put the name Jesus in there every once in a while. Because you know what? Mm, mm, mm. I try to get out of my head. But there's a lot of rock music, songs and lyrics in my head. And they put God and Jesus in there too. Yeah, yeah. yeah they did. Mm. You're getting me off on a tangent. I don't want to go. Children of Israel were sinning. Joshua and Moses come down. You know the story. Moses takes the, 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 the Ten Commandments and shatters them. Moses is angry and Moses throws a fit. <laughs> I love what he does. He, he takes that golden calf and he beats, has the guys beat it all down to powder. He carries it to their drinking water and flings it on the drinking water. All right, y'all. Want the gold so much? Drink. And he made the people drink. <laughs> and they did. I love it. I think it's great. I have a couple of church members I like to get to drink some powder or something. Mm. <coughs> I didn't say that. Please do not record that and scratch it. Mm. Joshua's come back. He's thrown his fit, if you will. And then God's fixing to throw his. And if you notice and you study that passage, you'll see that the tabernacle isn't where it's supposed to be. Because when God set up the tabernacle, he set it up in the center of the nation of Israel. He put the Levites around it and then he placed each tribe surrounding the tabernacle. The tabernacle was right in the center of the nation of Israel. But not now. Because God said, you're a stiff-necked people. I'm pulling my presence from the center of your nation and I'm putting it outside the camp. If you want to get to me now, you have to go outside the camp because I cannot be in the camp full of sin. God sets a tabernacle out there. The Bible says that God calls Moses to come to the tabernacle. Look at verse 7. And Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp far off from the camp and called it the tabernacle of the congregation. And it came to pass that everyone which sought the Lord went out to the tabernacle of the congregation, was with, which was without the camp. It came to pass when Moses was 
went out into the tabernacle. All the people rose up, stood every man at the door, and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. <laughs> Why? They were scared they was going to get blowed up. Hmm. And it came to pass, verse 9, as Moses entered in the tabernacle, a cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle of the Lord, talked with Moses. All the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle of the door. All the people rose up and worshipped every man in his tent door. <laughs> they finally realized, wow, this is the same God that parted the Red Sea. This is that same God that defeated the Egyptian army. This is the same God that brought all those plagues. This is the same God that turned that rod into a serpent. This is that same God. Wow! We better worship him now. Right. Hmm. It takes a while for some people to get it. But look at verse 11. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face. As a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp. But his servant Joshua. The son of Nun. A young man departed. Out of the, departed not. Out of the tabernacle. Departed not. Out of the tabernacle. I guess from what we studied, Moses had to follow proper procedure. Moses and Joshua must have brought in their sacrifice. They brought it into the courtyard of the tabernacle. They brought it to the priest and the priest the throat. And the priest escorted them through <laughs> past the brazen altar, past the brazen laver, and up into the tabernacle. And they got into the tabernacle. Something happened. Joshua was there with Moses, the great leader of Israel. Joshua was there with that great leader of Israel. And that great leader of Israel started talking to God. Now, in my opinion, I've always thought it's be like, Dear Jesus, Lord, heaven, God of the universe. That's not what the Bible says. My Bible says that God spoke to Moses. As a man speaking. I don't know how he did that. I can't fathom how he did that. How you doing? Going all right? Yeah? Why could Moses speak to God like that? Mm. Because he had a long-standing relationship with God. Wasn't his first conversation. He wasn't in a whole lot of trouble and say, God, I need something from you. You got to help me. I know you haven't heard from me in a year, but everything's been going good. Now I really need you. Hey, some of us just use God as a crutch to get us to the next trouble. That's right. Oh, we're in trouble now and we get out of trouble. God provides and we brag and we give testimony and we fall right back in the same sin. And we wonder, I wonder why I'm in trouble again. But boy, we run to God real quick when the trouble comes, don't we? Mm, that was extra. Moses standing there. Joshua was there too. Joshua was there too. What's Joshua doing? <laughs> hanging out with some good people. Yeah. It's hanging out. What would I be doing if I were Joshua? Oh, that's God. Oh, that's God. Moses, get down. Oh, Moses! How's he doing that? How's he talking to God like that? How in the world can he? Joshua got to experience the presence of God. Joshua got to experience the power of God. Got to, Joshua got to see how a man can experience that same power and the same presence. And Joshua observed this whole process. <laughs> Look what the Bible says. The Lord spake unto Moses face to face. The man speaketh unto his friend. But in verse 11, and he turned again unto the camp. Moses was done talking to God. I'm through. Through talking to God, I'm leaving. Come on, Joshua. I can't go. I can't go. What I've just seen, I can't go. I want what he has. God, you got to give me what he has. God, whatever he's got, i got to have it. And the Bible never tells us when Joshua leaves. But I think it was a long time because Joshua was on his face before God. Give me what that guy's got. Give me that presence. Give it to me. Give it to me. Oh, I want. I want you young people to know God's real. 
before I came up here, I had to run down and I was trying to do right and put a shirt on and tie so I fit in. So I put my shirt, I had to iron it in a boy's cabin on my, would somebody get them an iron that works? <laughs> I had to put my son's tie on because I didn't bring a tie. But while I was putting my shirt on, I said, oh, Holy Spirit, you're in a position that I don't know what to do with. I'm not qualifying. You've got doctors of theology sitting out in the crowd. And yet, one of those doctors of theology came and asked me to speak this afternoon to a bunch of kids. Lord, I can't do this. I'm not qualified. I'm not even qualified to be a nurse or an orderly. I'm just a guy. But God, you've laid it on Brother George's heart. God, if I could do one thing... Can I convince these young people that God is real? Amen. Can I convince them somehow that it's real? Can I allow them somehow to have a little bit of that experience that Joshua had as he was in the tabernacle watching the greatest leader maybe of all time stand before God? And why was he the greatest leader of all time? Because he could stand before God face to face as a man speaketh to a friend. I want you to understand that he's real. I want you to understand that he will help you. I'm not promising you what the prosperity gospel is promising. I'm not promising you'll be rich and wealthy. I'm promising that if you're poor, you'll be able to have a good life in spite of being poor. Study the rich man and Lazarus, if you would. Lazarus, I believe, had a time in his poor state. He was a Christian. He witnessed to, the, he witnessed to that man <laughs> over... And over again, how do I know? Look at the questions he asked Father Abraham. He knew. How did he know? Because Lazarus told him. And Lazarus wasn't there, I don't think, pleading for alms. I think he was there pleading for this man to accept Jesus. Won't you accept it today, Mr. Rich Man? Won't you accept him today? He's the greatest thing in the world. I can't promise you prosperity, but I can promise you grace as you go through hard times. I can promise you that if your wife passes away, you still with grace and strength can stand up. A pain in your heart that no one can understand. A pain in your heart that the world couldn't fathom. But he can get himself together. And depend on that, Lord. God, I don't understand it. But it's your will. I'm just going to keep trusting you. Why can Brother George do that? He had tabernacle experience. He saw God. He may not have seen him directly or indirectly. He saw God and through the years he is strove and strove till he saw God for himself. We have a group of young people. Unfortunately, you've not had too many troubles in your life. When you have a stumped toe, you fall apart. I used to be that way. And I broke my ankle in three places and cracked it in a third. They had to put metal inside of my ankle. What Brother George was talking about, some of the pain that he's been through the other night when he was talking about agony and gnashing teeth, I know what he's talking about. Because my foot was dislocated. When the doctor came in, he said, your foot's been dislocated on top of being broken in three places and cracked along the heel. He says, we're going to have to relocate your ankle to make sure that blood flow is proper. That stinking doctor. And yes, I said that stinking doctor. <laughs> grabbed hold of my busted foot that I could not hold still. Every move I made, it flopped ways it wasn't supposed to. And that stinky doctor grabbed my foot at the bottom and at the back. He had a nurse, a male nurse, grab my leg like this. And he commenced to pull an it on that and with no drugs, no pain, killers, nothing. But just for the record, I could not reach the doctor to kill him. <laughs> but that poor schmuck that he had holding my leg got beat up. <laughs> I 
I reached out and grabbed hold of his arm that was around my leg, and I squeezed, and I said, Argh! and he went, pull. <laughs> and I held it tight as the doctor, that's not right, let's move it a little bit more, a little bit more. Mm. I weeped and wailed and ganashed my teeth. Yes. And it ought to be ganashed because the G is there. I can know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but you know, I can stop my foot now. Hardly even feel it. I mean, I go, Ear. Before, when I stumped my toe, I had to elevate my foot, three and a half foot, put ice upon it for three days, and weep and wail. I busted my foot. You know what I've learned? Life for a Christian is just as hard as anyone else's life. But we have a Savior to lean on. I love the sand, the footprints in the sand. That little poem or whatever story it is. And at the end of the row, we look over our life. And there, hey, when the life, hey, when it's darkest and dreary in life, there's only one set of footprints. Lord, where were you? God looked down and said, silly, they were my footprints. I was carrying you. Joshua made it through life because he knew God was there to carry him. Joshua became the leader and a great leader he was because he learned that Jesus could carry him. Let me tell you what Psalm 15 says. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hills? He that walketh uprightly, worketh righteousness, speaketh the truth in his heart. God wants us to, number one, learn to walk with God. Hey, my friend, you have to read your Bible. 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 You have to read your Bible if you want to do anything for God. You have to. You say, but, oh, Brother Dusty, there's still pictures in it. Was there not a good picture of the tabernacle? And I promise you, I just gave you a little snippet. And some of you as teachers and preachers would do good to get into that tabernacle and dig it apart. Oh, man, there's so much in there. Mm, wish I had time. Get into the Word. You say, well, what about Joshua? This book of the law shall not depart out of my mouth. Joshua 1.8. You ever heard of that? That man held to the Bible. Let's see what else one that abides in the tabernacle gets. Verse 3, He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up reproach against his neighbor. Number one, walk with God are those that abide in the tabernacle. Number two, walk with man. Do you know Christians are not supposed to be the biggest jerks in town? Oh, but Brother Dusty, I believe this, and I believe this, and I believe this, and I believe this. But I believe that Jesus, when he walked on this earth, gathered a multitude, and a jerk would not have grabbed, a, gathered a multitude. Jesus was not a jerk. He was not hateful to people. He was loving to people, even with the Pharisees. He reprimanded the Pharisees, but he did it in such a way that they came back for more, crazy people. He was good to his fellow men. And sometimes some of the worst people in the world to do anything with are Christians. I had a lady come to me. We were looking for insurance at the church. She came to me. She gave me this pamphlet. She said, these people are Christians. I took that pamphlet and threw it in the trash. Why, Brother Dusty? Because those people were Christians. And most Christians in business will find their way, the best way possible to get as much out of you for nothing. And churches are guilty of the same thing. We are. Well, I am a church. Give me a break. I try not to do that. Just let me time out real quick here. If you go out to eat on Sunday, make sure you put the proper tip down. 15% minimum, even at a buffet. 20% is better. Do you know that waitresses and waiters hate Sunday? Because those of us that get out of church and run to the restaurant are so stinking cheap that we'll go there and make them run like crazy to take care of us. 
We'll leave $2 on the, the, the table and the church card. Yeah, that's right. And I've been a witness for the Lord. And those people depend on that tip money to make it through life. They get paid usually about $4 an hour, which is about half of minimum wage. That's what they get paid. The rest of their money has to come from tips. If it doesn't come, they starve. Stop and think about that next time you plan to rip somebody off. At the, go to McDonald's. You don't have to pay a tip. But who wants to eat McDonald's food? I know. Number one, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Someone that walks with God. Number two, someone that walks with men. You say, well, what about Joshua? I was going to write just a verse down, but I couldn't find one. So I wrote down this, Joshua chapter 13 through Joshua chapter 22. Probably the hardest group of people to deal with. Throughout history has been the nation of Israel. And Joshua divided the nations and divided the lands and put it all together. And nary one time is there an argument. The closest argument was Caleb saying, I want that mountain. He had a rapport with man. Number one, walk with God. Number two, walk with man. Look at verse four. Oh, why well, you probably aren't there no more in Psalm 15. In whose eyes a vile person is condemned, but he honoreth them that feareth the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. Take your Bibles and turn to Joshua chapter 24. Last place I'll make. I know I've had you turn a lot. Joshua chapter 24. And look at this verse 15 because that verse told us that one's going to abide in the tabernacle is not going to change. Hey, let me show you this Joshua guy. Look at verse what was that? 15? Yeah. Verse 15 of Joshua 24. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served and were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Old man Joshua. Fixing to die. Nation of Israel gathers around. What's he going to say? He said, I don't care what everyone does, but old man Joshua's going to do what old man Joshua's been doing all of his life and still serve the Lord. Amen. How could he not change? Because he stayed in the tabernacle. Who shall abide in my tabernacle? The problem with Christianity today is we don't have anybody in the tabernacle. Nobody. We don't have preachers. We don't have teachers. We don't have Sunday school workers. We don't have teenagers, definitely, that will get into the tabernacle and say, God, I gotta have you. I gotta have what Joshua had. I gotta have it. Then we have some that stay out the door. Bring your sacrifice. You look up there. I ain't taking my little lamb there. I'm not gonna get saved. You can never ever, ever experience a tabernacle experience unless you accept Jesus as your Savior. It's never going to happen. And many of us Christians that are trapped here, we've accepted Christ as Savior. We will go to heaven. We do not behave as Christians because that is uncool and no one likes that. Justin Bieber is not for that. Therefore, I will stay here as a saved individual and you'll get to heaven. Yet so as by fire, but you'll get to heaven. Hmm. It's so much better in the tabernacle, but you've got to go to another place before you get to that tabernacle. You've got to take that will of yours, wash it in that water, and clean up your life. And you get that life cleaned up, you can enter that tabernacle and be in the presence of God. Then when you read your Bible at the table of showbread, wow, this gets good. The light from that candlestick is going to shine so that Holy Spirit will show you what that Bible says. When you approach, the, oh, oh, this gets exciting here. As you approach to say your prayers at night, because the Bible says, I don't even know what I'm supposed to pray for. But as we approach <laughs> that altar of incense, Jesus, the light of the world, through the Holy Spirit, Will show me what to pray for as I ought. Lo and behold, I'll be in the presence of God. And that's where He wants me. That's where He wants you. Have 
Have you had a tabernacle experience? If you're not saved, uh uh-uh. If you are saved, is it just a, oh, I had a glimpse of it, but I didn't have it. Maybe you're like Joshua and you say, I saw it. Moses is leaving. Let's go. Missed that one. Or you're like Joshua. God, you've got to give me what Moses had. I can't live if I don't have what Moses had. i got to have that relationship. God, i got to. Where are the Christians that plead with God for his power? Let's bow our heads, our Heavenly Father.